Okay, good afternoon from Vienna and good morning to Washington DC. Sorry for this short delay. We had some technical issue and couldn't let the audience enter the room for whatever reason. We're still learning this new technology, it seems. So uh, first of all, I would like to wish everybody a happy and especially a healthy uh, new year 2024. And I would like to welcome everybody to this FIW uh, trade talks. Today we are discussing the topic revitalizing the world trading system. The FIW trade talks receive financial support from the Austrian Ministry of Labor and Economy, for which we are very grateful. My name is Harald Oberhofer and I'm your host of today's FIW trade talk. As usual, before turning to the topic and introducing our distinguished guest speaker, uh, let me just briefly remind you about the structure of the trade talk. So we're gonna uh, start this talk with a 15 to 20 minutes input of our guest. And after that, we will have about 40 minutes for further discussion on the topic. You can participate in the discussion by posting your questions and comments into the Q&A section in this Zoom call. And after the seminar, we will send you a very short feedback questionnaire and we would be very happy if you could give us feedback so that we can continuously try to improve the trade talks and our events in general. Having said that, I would like to immediately jump to our topic and uh, especially to our distinguished guest. I'm delighted to welcome Alan Wolf as our guest speaker of today, who will be speaking on revitalizing the world trading system. Today's talk is based on a book with the same title, which has been published in June 2023, if I'm not mistaken, and it has been published by Cambridge University. Press. Adam is a distinguished visiting fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Before joining the Peterson Institute, uh, Alan Wolf was uh, Deputy Director General of the World Trade Organization, the WTO. There, he was responsible for divisions dealing with accessions, agriculture, trade, and the environment, trade standards, translation, and information technology support. He is also a founder of the Trade for Peace Initiative, which joins WTO, the international financial institutions, and the peace community in their, in their efforts to provide assistance to fragile and conflict-affected countries. Uh, prior to joining the WTO, Ada, Ellen uh, served as, as United States Deputy Special Representative for Trade Negotiations in the Carter Administration and was General Counsel of the office in the Ford administration. He also served as acting head of the US delegation during the Tokyo round of multilateral trade negotiations within the trade work of the WTO. So very vast experience in trade policy and trade policy negotiations. His research focuses on developing reforms for the WTO. I think this is what we're gonna talk most today, responding to the role of the United States, the European Union, China in the international trading system and serving the needs for all countries in using trade to achieve economic prosperity. And Adam, uh, Ellen, Ellen Wolf uh, holds degrees from Harvard College and from Columbia University. Now with this very short introduction, I could have said much more about the rich uh, CV of Alan. Ellen, I would like to thank you for being with us today and hand over to you. The floor is yours. I'm very much looking forward to your input. Thank you very much, Harry. It's uh, good to be with you. Good to be with uh, your um, guests, the participants who have uh, uh, joined us uh, in Vienna and in surrounding places. Uh, I wrote this guidebook to the WTO, to the World Trading System, really, which uh, is made up of 164 countries, because you, no matter what, uh, how long you've spent with the organization or how long you've uh, interacted with the trading system, you can't know everything about the WTO. You only uh, see pieces of it that uh, concern you directly. Uh, the, the important thing is that we have gained enormous uh, world growth uh, during this 75 years between the founding of the world trading system in 1948, post-World War II period, um, uh, that has raised uh, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Uh, so it's a, a remarkable record and a remarkable transition. Trade 
is always going to be with us. The question is whether it will be well-regulated, whether it will be free, whether it can move across borders. Uh, the fascinating thing, it starts out in this book about the history of trade, that uh, there was trade before there was a, our species was on this planet. So before Homo sapiens, the Neanderthals and others, they were actually uh, they needed better uh, uh, materials for their tools. They actually traded. They didn't leave us a written record. There was no writing for millennia to follow. But in fact, there was trade. And say today we have we know that we need things from distant places. Uh, during uh, COVID, we need. Uh, uh, vaccines. Not every country can produce vaccines. We need vaccines. Uh, we even need face masks and uh, personal protective equipment. We need to trade to deal with our challenges. Uh, we need graphite to make um, batteries for uh, EVs, uh, electric vehicles. Uh, we have to trade. So uh, trade is always going to be vitally important to us. Uh, we like the luxuries of trade. We like to have uh, vegetables from Africa in uh, the middle of winter that we can't grow very effectively in the north. Uh, all of this comes from trade. So I start there, and then the question is, okay, what does the World Trade Organization do about it? Um, it started with some very basic principles, equality of access to markets, equality of access to supplies. A very simple uh, statement that uh, even bef just before the war, um, when the war was starting, um, uh, the uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Winston Churchill got together in uh, Canada uh, in 1941, and they said, "This, this is this is our objective. Our, this is our war aim. This is where we'll end up." And they did. So uh, they started out with the idea of uh, an organization that would have non-discrimination. Uh, that they would uh, commit to their tariff levels so they wouldn't uh, they'd get rid of their quotas, their quantitative restrictions. Uh, they wouldn't restrict trade unduly. And there would be transparency. They'd notify their trade measures. Uh, it started with 23 countries in 1948. It went up to 132 by the time the WTO was founded in 1995. And now it's 164. And it's growing. It's going to be universal. Um, the, uh, this was also a peace project. Uh, the theory was that if you raise the standard of living of peoples, uh, if, if you integrate them into the world economy, they'll be less likely, they'll be less likely to go to war. It's, it's not a guarantee. Putin can still go into, uh, Ukraine. It's not a guarantee, but it helps, uh, formulate uh, peace, and it heals wounds. So you have the European Union, uh, before that, the common market of the EU, and uh, we're deploying uh, the world trading system in the cause of peace. So we say to Ukraine, come in to, when I say we, it's the Europeans, say, you are now welcome to negotiate to join the, uh, the European Union. So that's an aspect that we don't think much about, but it's a peace project. It's a peace project for conflict-affected countries of um, uh, mostly least developed countries. So Sudan, South Sudan, Somalia, uh, Ethiopia, uh, Timor Leste. They what do they want? They want to raise the standard of level, the standard of living of the the level of their peoples, in order to attain peace and preserve it. Um, the trade rules have worked very well to date. There are new challenges. We talked a little bit about the pandemic. Uh, there's going to be another pandemic. We are not in a very good position yet. We have no new we have no new rules for trade in a pandemic. So we have not learned yet how to deal with that. Uh, with climate change, we need to get food from places where it can be grown to places where it's desperately needed. That's trade. And we need we don't have rules to get the, the food from where it is uh, grown to where it is needed. Uh, the environment we do not have uh, we do not foster environmentally uh, sound uh, trade, uh, but we could. The digital world, the digital world, uh, digital commerce 
came along after the WTO was founded. So we haven't uh, faced up to the fact that we need rules governing digital trade, and we're not headed there very um, quickly. Um, we have a ministerial conference. This is where all the ministers, the trade ministers of the 164 member countries get together, and they will in Abu Dhabi at the end of February. And we say, well, what can come of that? Uh, first of all, what's important is no backsliding. In other words, uh, there has been a moratorium in effect not to apply customs duties to what they call electronic transfers, the words that they use to describe the digital trade that we all engage in now and benefit from. So will a moratorium against a, the prohibition to apply customs duties be scrapped? It's, it has to be renewed every two years. Um, how do we get no, get negotiations started again? It's very difficult to have all 164 join in a negotiation and get something done, frankly. So the question is whether groups of like-minded countries who want to move forward on the digital economy, on small and medium enterprises, rules that are benefit uh, small and medium enterprises, on uh, uh, domestic regulation of services, on a number of these things, how can, how can we move forward among groups of like-minded countries? Um, the, there needs to be binding dispute settlement. Again, binding only means you accept the result as being final. That's what a judgment is for. It doesn't mean you necessarily can collect on that judgment. You may have problems doing that. What it means is there's been a definitive answer to the question of whether you right or wrong. Were you in violation of the rules or were you not in violation of the rules? And the United States blocked that for most uh, uh, members of the WTO uh, uh, don't have binding dispute settlement anymore. Um, so how do I handle this in this book? Uh, first of all, I let the reader understand what the values are of the WTO, that it works for peace, for example, with these conflict-affected countries in particular. Uh, it uh, believes in non-discrimination. Uh, it believes in least restriction possible uh, in when you apply product standards. So there are maybe 20 different values promoted by the WTO, which need to be understood because they're the way we have economic growth in the world. Uh, I uh, turn to a rather pragmatic uh, sort of, uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you go to a tour, as a tourist to Vienna, you'd better have a guidebook. Um, you want to know uh, what the palaces were all about. You want to know where to go. Uh, so I let the reader walk through the corridors of the WTO and attend meetings. Uh, the, one of the most interesting meetings that ever took place in the WTO was bringing China in. China had a very different economy, different form of economy. Uh, and there were a lot of questions. There was a lot of debate. So I let the, the reader experience that debate. Uh, similarly, uh, a meeting of the dispute settlement body, uh, which uh, discusses uh, litigation cases that are under litigation. So I give a, I don't think this has been done elsewhere, I give uh, the reader an actual feel for what actually takes place in a room, a uh, meeting room of the WTO. Um, uh, product standards sounds very boring, uh, and it can be. But in fact, uh, it can be also very interesting. So the Chinese delegate says that to the European Union, you know, you've notified a regulation on how quickly and in what way uh, a automated vehicle, an, uh, an autonomous vehicle, when it, it notices the driver's falling asleep, how quickly should it react? What should it do? There's a new standard that the EU promulgated a couple of years ago and in draft. And the, the Chinese representative, uh, uh, and since they're on the forefront of the automated vehicles as well, uh, they said, well, we think that you haven't thought through this problem um, fully. And it's, it's not contentious at all. It's not a litigation. It is not a case that's being brought by one country against another. It's simply, we notify a standard. It could be a standard for 
avoiding uh, salmonella, a disease for uh, fruit uh, coming into your country. He said, well, wait a minute. Uh, is this the least restrictive that you could be with respect to that particular standard? Uh, is, is this the standard that should apply to baby formula? And actually, it gets... It, it's it's very important. It's very pragmatic because it's not a tariff. You can you can get around a tariff. You pay the tariff, uh, but you can't get around a standard. In other words, trade ceases. So it's it's important uh, to do to look at that. I trace the history of the WTO through its ministerial conferences. This come, one coming up is the twelfth. Uh, they happen, but for COVID, every two years. Um, so the book uh, introduces you to the to new problems and old problems, like how do you handle handle the development uh, function of the WTO? How does trade work to advance the development of developing countries? There are a lot of very poor countries that are in the WTO. Uh, I chaired a forum on cotton development assistance. Cotton is largely grown uh, in very poor countries as their primary product of uh, to earn uh, uh, income in this world. And uh, Chad, Mali, Benin, Burkina Faso, the West African, full West African cotton producers come into a room and they say, help us get more income from what we're producing. How do you do that? Uh, cotton byproducts, cotton seed oil made into a cooking oil, which is, requires a transformation. Uh, can we use some of the the parts of the cotton uh, plant stems to make something else, the so building materials. Uh, help us do this. And the fact is, all countries are very positive and responsive, without exception. It's, it's, a one, it's one of the only places you can go in a, in a meeting among countries where there's no contentiousness. The, those, the other cotton producing countries like India or Pakistan, they don't argue with each other. They don't argue with the West uh, uh, Africans. They come into that room and they say, we can help you. We can help you do this. And Brazil, a major cotton producer. The United States, a major cotton producer. Australia, a major cotton producer. They're all there and they're there to be helpful. So there's some very positive things that go on uh, within the, the WTO, but the problem of development is one of the major problems that's out there. Agricultural trade is very sensitive. There is no country in which the agricultural community is not politically very important, very sensitive to trade, uh, very sensitive to policies of the government, very sensitive with respect to the subsidies that they are paid uh, to, because uh, uh, the vagaries of weather, the um, uh, uh, events from, weather events that take place in greater number because of uh, uh, climate change uh, disrupt uh, trade and agriculture a great deal. And the rules are have advanced a good deal with the WTO, but they're not there yet. They have not successfully dealt with all the subsidies uh, successfully uh, and all the limitations. Uh, so I look at how the organization has to be reformed. How do we get back to binding dispute settlement? Uh, where you get an answer at the end of the day. Right now, very often, uh, there's a so-called appeal to uh, an organization a body within the WTO. It doesn't exist. The appellate body went away four years ago. It's called an appeal into the void by those who look at these things. Uh, why? It's, uh, uh, it goes nowhere, so there's no answer. Uh, the future of the WTO... I think, is ultimately bright. I mean, a note I'll end on. Why? Because it makes sense. Because uh, it makes sense to trade openly with each other. And uh, there will be times of stress, uh, geopolitical stress. China and the United States do not trade freely with each other. Um, for that matter, there's stress with the, uh, with the European Union when uh, uh, Lithuania recognizes... Uh, the establishment of a Taiwan office, these things happen and they happen all the time uh, and they have to be worked through cooperatively. And we don't have the system in place that works as effectively as it should, but we will. I think I have great faith that we will uh, because uh, it just practically makes good sense. 
to ultimately have uh, trade continue to uh, raise, in general, the standard of living around the world, uh, take people out of poverty, uh, favor entrepreneurial activity. So I'll end there and look forward to our discussion and any questions that folks have. Thank you so much, Ellen. I think there is a lot of uh, uh, food for thought and for discussions in, in your input. And um, I do like your very positive uh, approach to the future of the WTO, because many scholars, I would argue, are much more skeptical nowadays, especially with the geopolitical uh, framework we are seeing nowadays and the tensions between major trading economies like you already mentioned the us and china so uh, i would maybe start with some first questions but just as a reminder for the audience please uh, put your your questions and comments into the q a section i will pick them up in our discussion so uh, let, let me maybe start with the first question which i found interesting is um, you mentioned the point that it's difficult and it is with uh, 164 countries that are on the table and everybody has to agree on a proposal that it's difficult to move things forward. And you mentioned maybe there would be a chance to have uh, groups of like-minded countries that uh, get, get things done and deviate a bit from the general stuff. Isn't that actually then in violation of WTO in your point of view? Because if if we deviate from the idea that it's it should be working for everybody and we should have a multilateral trade system that is uh, that is transparent and uh, the same for everybody, if some countries would move away in terms of uh, specific regulations while others would not agree on that. The uh, fact of the matter is one of the defects of the WTO is what has happened with the idea of consensus. Uh, consensus should mean no one really objects the, to moving forward uh, with a particular agreement or with a particular decision, uh, as opposed to uh, everyone has a veto and they exercise it all the time freely. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a trading stock, for example. Uh, take hostages in any negotiation uh, and a political system in a, in a city, in a, in a state, in a country, uh, seizes up, and it's true in an international organization, if everybody says, well, I'll agree with this, but uh, this was sort of reminiscent of the EU Council with uh, Hungary on the outside of uh, some decisions, saying, I, what will you give me if I, if I agree with you? It has to work more smoothly than that. The WTO has to graduate to the point where the like-minded can move ahead. Now, what what can they do with respect to non-participants? The big question that you raise. Mm -hmm. Many things, they're not going to, for example, in the digital economy, uh, apply a different standard. Uh, they say, we'll all apply international standards with respect to transfer of data across borders. Uh, uh, does there have to be reciprocity or will they have just one standard? So that's a, a, an issue that will have to be solved agreement by agreement. But the question, a question is for the countries that are members of the WTO, will they allow others who are ready to move forward to move forward to liberalize further? And of course, there are exceptions already to non-discrimination for free trade agreements. And the idea is, and the EU is the major practitioner in the world of free trade agreements, uh, and it's trying to get one with Mercosur currently. Uh, yes, it's discriminatory uh, to give better tariff treatment between the two of you, but the idea behind it is if we have that discrimination, it will be that we give better treatment than generally we give. We've already liberalized to a large extent, and it will be trade creating for others. The non-participants will benefit as well, and they make that decision uh, each and every time a free trade agreement uh, comes through, that uh, it comports with the rules of the system. Uh, yeah. So um, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult question of when they, they, they say in a particular agreement, well, you're not participating, you're a free rider. Uh, and will we give you the benefits or not? That's going to be one tough negotiation. 
Yeah, sure. But, but maybe just to, to add on on this discussion, I already have a first question, which I would like to bring in in a second. But before that, just maybe two more questions. The first one would be uh, just a direct follow up. Um, I, I would totally agree with this. And, and as you mentioned, the idea of having free trade agreements is already laid down in the GATT agreement. So this is something you can, of course, do. And we're going to see that that happened more frequently after 95. So after the creation of WTO actually than before that. So uh, you could also argue that it's more like substituting multilateral liberalization policies with preferential trade policy uh, liberalization uh, policies or, or agreements. But but just coming back to this like-minded story, I, I, I don't really see this point on, on consensus, but isn't it difficult to, to argue for more consensus if in one of the cornerstones of WTO, as you mentioned, the dispute settlement uh, part of it. And you, you're not having any binding dispute settlement anymore. And this is mainly due to one of the major trading partners or trading economies within WTO. So put it differently, isn't it difficult to say to developing countries, let, let, let us move forward with more liberalization on the digitalization or digital commerce in, or agriculture or whatever, but we are not doing anything to get this thing about the dispute settlement in order again. I think the rules have to be binding. We have to go back to that. The United States, who, uh, which is the party that really uh, blocked the system by mm -hmm. blocking appointments to the appellate mm -hmm. uh, level uh, of dispute settlement, uh, the United States had... Uh, it is now acknowledged by some, but maybe many, um, some real complaints. What What are the complaints? One was uh, the appellate body, this this higher level bunch of judges. They couldn't find a um, a case of uh, uh, say anti dumping or countervailing duties, the trade remedies that was appropriate. They, in fact, they ended up not allowing any safeguard actions uh, pretty much to go through, and they killed off the safeguards code that was negotiated in the in uh, the founding of the, the, the WTO. Uh, so they made some mistakes. They over What the U.S. said, they overreached. Now, is that negotiable? I think it is negotiable to have a, a, a clean slate and move ahead. The United mm -hmm. States also said more recently, don't tell us what we say is in our national security interest. We said our national security interest required us to put on uh, restrictions on your steel and aluminum exports to us. Now, uh, the, pretty much all the other countries, without exception, said this is complete nonsense, that uh, you're putting restrictions on your own allies' trade. And how can it be national security when you say, Canada, which supplies 70% of your aluminum ingots that you're making aluminum things from, that they're threatening your national security, it's total nonsense. So um, what what is it, one answer to this? If you put on restrictions for national security, you still pay a price for doing it. You will It will not be reviewed on whether it was in your national security interest. That We won't second guess your domestic judgment, but... If you harm someone else's trade in putting on one of these restrictions, then they have a right to either be compensated or they can retaliate. And this is the way the WTO really, and the GATT before it, uh, it, the way it operated is you made a, you, if you had a concession that was too painful over time for you to sustain it, you, there was a way of withdrawing the concession and having a renegotiation of the level of concessions so that you had to pay a price but taking back what you already gave. National security, you're taking back something you already gave. and mm -hmm. But you're, by invoking the words national security, you're saying well, it's free. It's not, it shouldn't be free. That's, that's another thing. The third area of difficulty to get back, in my view, to get mm -hmm. back to finding the suicide settlement for the United States is to say, don't you understand we're in a com competition with China? We don't like the way China operates. We in the United States don't like the way China operates. So we put on tariffs and the Chinese in response put on their own tariffs on U.S. goods. That has to be sorted out between the two. 
you have to have the ability, I think, to have non-application of the rules of binding concessions between China and the U.S. to the extent that they have to they have to resolve these things themselves, and they have to find their own new equilibrium. And it's going to be an exception. It's a painful exception, but uh, uh, we started out pretty well in the WTO uh, with respect to U.S.-China disputes. Uh, the first one was in 2004. China applied a discriminatory rebate of a of a border tax, value added tax, and uh, it favored its own uh, producers in semiconductors rather than foreigners. Uh, China realized it was acting against the rules that withdrew the measure. We have to get back to what are the boundaries of the competition, and we're not going to solve that in the WTO in a dispute settlement uh, negotiation other than allowing some degree of flexibility for these two superpowers who are in conflict to work out some of these problems in a way that's satisfactory to them. But can we get back to binding dispute settlement? In most cases, yes, I think we can. Thank you. Uh, maybe I, I now bring in the first question because it's directly related to the dispute settlement uh, uh, point we just discussed, and it's from Manfred Czekolin from the Federal Ministry. And uh, he, he asked, can a possible solution to the dispute settlement crisis include a second tier the appellate body, or would we have to settle on something Different. So, a rather specific question on what could be an institutional reform with respect to the to the mechanism that it makes them makes the mechanism work better for everybody. Yeah, I, my answer is I think we should have a second tier uh, that, uh, but it should be for making correcting mistakes, not for every case. Right now, it's become a, lit a litigative system in which uh, you appeal everything. Why? For domestic political reasons, for example, you want to show that you, as a government, fought like hell for your people, uh, mm -hmm. went the extra step. Uh, it could be for worse reasons than that. It could be uh, you want to hang on to the measure that's in violation as long as possible because you politically it's useful to you to have put on, let's say, protection that was found to be invalid, contrary to the rules. So you want to hang on to it. And it's become a system of endless litigation. Uh, Boeing Airbus uh, was something like 16 years of litigation. Uh, you know, that's nonsense. The system wasn't built uh, with the idea that you would appeal everything and it would be endless. So uh, uh, there has to be a, a short, I think there's general agreement now, a short fuse, a short period of... Um, uh, say, 60 to 90 days, uh, you must have an answer. And they've done this with a substitute mechanism uh, that Europe put forward, that Canada joined with it, and uh, Japan now and several others are members mm. of the interim arrangement of, we'll give you an answer, and it works. We'll give you an answer in 60 to 90 days. I would also say, if you're, if you're found at the first level to be in violation then you pay a price then, you may get it back, but uh, you, you a, an appeal does not keep an effective answer from being put into place. You can't appeal forever in order to delay things uh, mm -hmm. without uh, getting a balance of concessions back again. So I favor a two-tier. I think the U.S. government's not in the slightest bit convinced of that, but there has to be a real joining of negotiators seriously to say, okay, what can we come up with that we can work together to achieve? Uh, and I, will there be egregious errors on occasion? Yes. Will there be errors in every case? Nonsense. You know, so uh, you have to sort through that. Does the appellate body uh, a hunting expedition to uh, decide matters that even the parties hadn't thought of, which has happened? No. It can only address those matters that are put before the uh, appellate body by uh, the um, by the litigants. So the, the court system has to be revised. Uh, is it possible? I think so. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I would totally agree on the, especially the point on speeding up process would be very welcome 
So it just takes too long in many cases. And I think this frustrates, of course, also policymakers if you don't get any answers that you want to hear uh, and not at any time after all. Um, so so well, maybe- that's... It also takes, takes 60 to 90 days just to read their opinions. Sure. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's gotten too complex. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. complexity is an issue there, definitely. Total, totally agree also on this one. And maybe just just moving on to to a next point, which I would also be interested in. And two of my colleagues already posted similar questions on this uh, point in in the Q and A. It's and it's related to CBAM. So let's move away a bit from the U.S. and China story to what we Europeans are doing. So uh, front, I'm just reading out both questions, but they are very related. So it's a matter of what WTO would say to to CBAM basically. So so Francina Bell is asking last year. EU launched CBAM. This may become a substantial disruption of trade and may trigger retaliation. What is your view on this policy and may WTO offer solutions? And Javier has a very similar question. How does the implementation of the Corbin border adjustment mechanism align with or violate specific WTO rules and principles such as non-discrimination, most favored nation and national treatment obligations? I would like to know your opinion on this. Yeah, with respect to CBAM, uh, really with respect to dealing with environment, the basic environmental issues that we face today, uh, the WTO has not made progress that's at all sufficient. Uh, so the EU has said, I think not unreasonably, we're doing what we have to do. Now, uh, those whose trade is adversely affected is going to say, that may be the case, but the current WTO really doesn't allow you to do that. The EU will say, yes, it does. Uh, there will be arguments about it. There'll be litigation about it, but it's a, it's a um, an unfortunate way to handle this situation uh, because there should be a very serious negotiation in the WTO as, look, we've all pledged in the Paris Agreement to cut back on uh, uh, the uh, emissions of uh, greenhouse gases uh, now, uh, we're doing it in different ways. Uh, some have a price for carbon. Others uh, try to deal with it by regulation. Uh, we have to really sit down and, and have these different systems mesh. Otherwise, we'll have trade disputes. And I don't doubt that there'll be very serious trade disputes. Not every country is going to, a trading country, is going to agree with the European Union that it's picked the right it's measured the uh, uh, the amount of uh, tariff or any tariff that is appropriate. Um, we have not yet come to grips. We have not found a way in the WTO to come to grips with the with the major problems of our time. And one of the key ones is global warming is here, and uh, climate change is here. So uh, we have to find ways of. Uh, of um, negotiating out a solution. Now, is CBAM, will CBAM be in violation? Uh, that's going to be litigated. Uh, th I don't think there'll be an agreement on it. Those adversely affected are saying, uh, you didn't have the right, and you didn't, and if you, if you did have the right, you certainly didn't do this correctly and fairly. You didn't estimate correctly that we, who are sending you steel or sending you uh, uh, other carbon intensive uh, goods, uh, cement. Uh, uh, in fact, you picked a, a methodology that favors your domestic industry potentially over us, and uh, we're not going to pay the price. So I think it's going to become uh, very contentious. And uh, But do I tell the EU you shouldn't go forward? On the contrary, I say, how are you ever going to get to a discussion unless somebody goes forward and tries to find a solution by um, uh, finding their own solution and then seeing whether other other countries can come to grips with it appropriately? So it, it's mm -hmm. uh, the the answers aren't there yet, uh, but they will be, um, and not everybody plays by the same rules. So. Um, uh, it is not uncommon in dealing with China that you do one thing in one area and you find something else happening to your trade in another area, maybe French cognac or something else, uh, which uh, they say, well, 
we have a problem with that. And you got to sit down and work these things out or yep. you're going to lose trade. Yeah, but so the, the cognac story is retaliation for the electrical vehicle story, as far as I understood, right? Yeah. Um, so I have plenty more questions. So I think I just stick to what I have from the audience. So thanks everybody for participating so actively in this discussion. Um, I, now I would have two questions. We do one by one on the relationship between developed and developing economies in WTO. Uh, the first one is again from Manfred Cecholin, who by the way also thanks you a lot for the inspiring presentation and he promised to restrict himself to not too many questions because he would have a lot, lot more. Uh, but but uh, to coming to emerging economies and, and multilateral rules, so, so he says the Modi administration has recently significantly softened its stance on trade issues, but only in bilateral negotiations, not within the WTO. Is there anything that could be done to change the Indian, also maybe South African perspective on multilateral on the multilateral system? So his impression is that also those larger and dynamically uh, evolving or developing economies, especially India, is also moving away from WTO and multilateral policies more to bilateral uh, free trade agreement style of trade policy. And the question would be whether WTO can offer something against this trend or something like that. Well, I met with uh, the new, before I left Geneva in 2021, I met with the new Indian ambassador and separately with the new South African ambassador, among other new ambassadors I would meet with. And I didn't think that they were uh, beyond uh, reach in terms of Coming now, these are the local representatives. These are not necessarily the people in New Delhi or in uh, Cape in uh, Pretoria, uh, uh, and uh, you know sometimes you can't come to any solution whatsoever. But uh, if if you said, uh, "What are your interests?" You had a serious discussion. What do, What do you need? For example, um, the, the Indians care a lot about public stockholding. It's their form of uh, uh, dealing with food security. It's their form, which is very emotional in a country the size of India, uh, where a lot of people live at the poverty level. Um, and uh, it is also a means of uh, supporting your agricultural community, depending on where you set the prices when you buy public stocks. Um, is there no solution? I think there's a solution. And uh, now it, it may be just about food security and nothing else, or it may be, what else do you need? India, uh, don't you need intellectual property protection for the apps because you do very well in software? India, don't you need uh, potentially greater market access for services, for supplying, uh, um, you know, at the WTO, we relied upon an Indian company for mm -hmm. our IT support. Uh, uh, you know, what do you need? And we don't have that conversation. We, you should go to, if you're appointed to represent a country uh, at the WTO, basically you should be a trade negotiator. You have certain things that you want to bring home and you have certain things that you can't possibly touch. And you got to feel out what those are. So is it impossible to deal with... Uh, uh, these countries that are uh, very often uh, seen as halting progress on anything. Uh, I don't think so. I think it's a matter of what do you need? What do you need to bring home to show your own people that you develop, you, you got something for them. Now, um, many countries are taking a bilateral or regional route. Uh I th some of it will be simply something we should applaud. Like I think the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, uh, mm -hmm. there's been so little intra-African trade uh, compared with um, sending raw materials to uh, Europe and the US and elsewhere, the Northern Hemisphere uh, and China. Uh, uh, we ought to do everything we can to help the Africans it's, and it's discriminatory. It's uh, it's uh, within the rules, but it's it's zero tariffs within Africa and not outside of Africa. 
so that sort of regional agreement, I think we want, we're, we should be working hard to make sure it works uh, collectively uh, because the need is there. Other cases, we may say, well, wait a minute. Um, a bilateral agreement is uh, pure discrimination and not much gain for anybody else or the world trading system. It's not innovative. It doesn't deal with labor. It doesn't deal with environment. It doesn't deal with our, uh, the um, COVID uh, pandemics. Um, it really adds nothing to the system. It's simply discriminatory. We ought to have a, an open conversation about that. But if progress can be made uh, bilateral or plurilaterally, in other words, uh, regionally, uh, or with uh, among several countries, uh, should have an open mind to it as building on the system rather than uh, contrary to it. But mm -hmm. it's going to be case by case. Uh, the digital e economy um, uh, agreement, DEPA, uh, four countries have started, and uh, the U.S. and uh, Japan have a you know a digital agreement between them. Are these good for the world? Are they good for the parties, for that matter? Um, I think we have to look at um, a world that works on multiple speeds because they are only capable of multiple speeds. Uh, and there'll be negative aspects that have to be curbed and positive aspects that have to be supportive. But it's, it's worth looking at things with greater flexibility. Thanks. Um, we, we stay with the, the, the relationship between developing and developed economies, and also we stay with the example of India. And, but we are, we are moving to, to, the, to the example you mentioned about cotton, and the question from Robert Stera is about subsidies and their role for international trade. So he, he states, uh, one of the biggest problems of WTO is the role of subsidies. Each is stuck in the dough around. You talked about the cotton industry, which is heavily subsidized by the U.S. What is your stance about subsidies, particularly with respect to developing countries? For example, India subsidizing food production. I think one has to find out what the new boundaries should be. Um, domestic subsidies are very unregulated by the rules. Um, doesn't mean that there aren't some bounds um, in, in agriculture in particular, there are some, but domestic subsidies in general are proliferating and um, in both the industrial area and in food, in food production, um, and they have to be re-examined. Uh, the interesting thing is that in some cases, some of the, the um, disciplines because they're outdated. They were based on a base period of the late 1980s. Uh, because they're outdated, they are actually tighter as restrictions than um, uh, over time than uh, these countries would like. So, um, uh, but it's difficult to get a serious discussion uh, moving because what the, what the agricultural exporting countries will say is we'll talk about um, um, your need for food security, but we also have to talk about market access, something that uh, many countries don't want to talk about at all in agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we're going to have to talk about the limits on subsidies because agricultural production patterns have changed dramatically uh, since the 1980s when the base periods were... Uh, were looked at, uh, uh, and is there any mutual benefit to be found? You can't, you can't know that until you start the, the conversation, and we don't have that conversation. We what we have is a repetition of positions. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it's this very sterile process so far. Um, uh, so, and uh, this is in many areas we have to get beyond it, but it's not so much developed versus developing because after all. Argentina and Brazil have very different interests than, uh, you know, India might, um, or uh, food importing countries might. Yeah, but uh, maybe as 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 you said, I I think this is the greatest obstacle over well maybe the last more than twenty years that everybody's just repeating their own positions all the time and with uh, the veto.
to power for everybody. We just don't have uh, have have an idea on how to overcome this because we we have this agricultural trade uh, versus industrial products discussion since since ages nowadays and and maybe related to this now because I have one more question. I think this is a nice concluding. Uh, question, but I already know a bit of the answer because we already talked about this before we we started. We opened the room for everybody. So Manfred Czekolin is asking, what would be necessary for the forthcoming ministerial meeting to be considered a success? What do you consider a likely outcome? So two questions in a sense. What would be very, if, if it would be a great success and what is the most likely, what is going to happen in the next ministerial meeting next month? CM, I it may differ from some others in that uh, I would put first no backsliding. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, we're not looking for diluting the rules. We're looking for adding to them in the uh, in in the direction of fostering trade. So um, the United States took a position that I regret which was uh, moving away from uh, having obligations with respect to free movement of data uh, in the digital world, uh, uh, the obligation not to be forced to, to locate server farms uh, within a country in order to serve that uh, country's digital economy uh, and forced to reveal your source code. And the US said, ah, for domestic reasons, actually, having to do with antitrust, I think, uh, competition policy, um, we need our policy space. Well, what is policy space? Policy space is we want to be free to restrict our trade. Do you understand that? That's policy space. And the developing countries say it's really a very nice um, euphemism for trade protection. Uh, it's what Pascal Lamy calls precautionism. So, A no backsliding. In other words, the moratorium on uh, tariffs on digital commerce uh, should be maintained. No, no customs duties on digital commerce. Um, secondly, uh, make some progress on uh, current matters like the fishery subsidies and negotiations. Uh, repair what is broken. Uh, start a real conversation on dispute settlement that's promising which we don't quite have yet that really promises to get back to binding dispute settlement uh, to engage on the real uh, difficult subjects and to put into place thirdly a roadmap for going forward on agriculture on pandemics on environment uh, to have serious roadmaps, uh, roadmaps uh, that are realistic um now, are we going to have all of that? Uh, it's not shaping up that way. Uh, so realistically, uh, uh, can we have no backsliding? I hope so. Uh, can we have uh, some progress reports and some uh, a degree of uh, understanding of where to go from here? Uh, I would hope so. Um, you know, there are a lot of good things happening in the world of trade. Uh, there are regional agreements that are moving forward. Uh, there are some things uh, that are innovations in the Indo-Pacific uh, framework area. The U.S. is involved with with RCEP uh, and with uh, uh, CPTPP, the the uh, the old Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, uh, that uh, um, build upon the WTO and shouldn't be regarded as a negative. Um, uh, but as uh, laboratories for experimentation to get back to Geneva to do better things multilaterally. So uh, I would like to see the uh, investment facilitation for development agreement, uh, which is not earth-shaking, but is useful uh, to be um, approved as part of the WTO agreements, even if not all WTO members are participants. That would be a major breakthrough. That would be a great success. Is that doable? I think it's doable. Uh, it would be very contentious with some of our uh, uh, countries that uh, want to uh, say, uh, we want to control the agenda. We're taking this as a hostage. 
uh, but it's not a good hostage. A lot of developing countries want it, and uh, backed by China, which is new and different uh, and positive. So uh, uh, we could get some good results out of it. Those those few things would be don't do don't do, first do no harm, and secondly add something positive to the system. I think that's possible. Thank you so much. Uh, it's almost five o'clock, so we are perfectly in time. Um, so, well, I think yeah, if we could have small steps in the right direction with the upcoming ministerial meeting, that would be already a great success, given the the global uh, geopolitical circumstances and world we are currently living in. So let's hope for the best and let's hope for, as you have pointed out, the idea of understanding consensus again, that would be very helpful indeed. So uh, for, for these negotiations to take part in February. Uh, Ellen, it was uh, my so, so great pleasure to have you today. I enjoyed it really a lot. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks everybody for tuning in today and for all your great questions and your active participation in this uh, FIW trade talk. Um, Again, I wish all a very happy new year. Thanks, everybody, and have a great evening And uh, in, in Washington. Have a great day, Alan. Thank you so much again. Bye. Thank you. Bye.